to kick things off. Oh, she can. Michelle's muted right now. Michelle, you yeah. might not unmute yourself. Oh, okay. All right. Now, can you can hear me now? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, great. So, thank you. I'm Michelle Kipke. I co-direct the CTSI with Tom Buchanan, um, also a professor in pediatrics and preventive medicine. I'm vice chair of research at Children's Hospital, and um, the dean had asked me to um, help lead this uh, activity. We're calling it the COVID Research Task Force, but Really, it's an effort to um, try and coordinate, facilitate, and support research that's related to COVID. Sort of has two functions to it. Um, one is we really want to really encourage and support, and, and where there are barriers, we want to try and figure out how to eliminate those barriers to support investigators to move their COVID-related research forward. Um, so that's sort of a, a, it's the... And, part of overarching aim of, of why we have this task force. The, the other part of it, and this is important too, is to have some governance because we are talking about access to resources where some of those resources are limited. And um, so we are also having to prop up a uh, governance structure where folks can apply for access to resources, whether it's the BSL-3 or it's access to um, specimens in the biorepository or to patients for a clinical trial. And then we, through that governance process, there's a scientific review and prioritization and, 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 and decisions based on that. So what I'm sharing with you here is just sort of an overarching structure for this task force. Um, we have, uh, I think at this point, we have about 30 members on the task force and these are individuals who cut across different disciplines, different schools, they're key stakeholders in the scientific enterprise at Keck School of Medicine. Um, um, from that group, we uh, did I develop what we are calling research affinity groups. And these are sort of groups that are focused on, on different uh, research uh, topics or sort of uh, along a translational spectrum. So from a preclinical to clinical trials and therapeutics, as you see here, all the way down to epidemiology, population research, and community outreach and engagement for mitigation. So really very broad in, its, in the scope of research that folks are focusing on right now. And, um, and we're, we're, you know, this is, we're, we're, this is new. We're, we're just getting this up and running, although we've been at it for a few weeks. Um, but it's, it's really been a, a very exciting process. Um, it, it is not our intent to create sort of an exclusive process or a, you know, sort of a group of people who are, you know, doing all the good work and getting access to the resources. We really want this to be very uh, uh, inclusive, big tent, um, but this was uh, the approach that we took as a, as a starting point to get ourselves up and running. Um, Tom, I know you just joined. If, if you have any uh, other thoughts. Um, well, I want to thank you for leading this and thank everybody for participating. As Michelle said, we're, we have a, a structure in place because we want to try to organize the response to this. I've never been through a war, fortunately, but this is a bit of a war. Things are unpredictable and we need to work at a very different pace than we're used to working um, in science. Um, I think the, the purpose of the committee right now um, is to, as Michelle said, if we if you need access for the basic research of the BSL-3 or to your own lab to do um, COVID research, we would like to support and encourage that. But we don't want to drop our scientific guard. We don't want to let people with any crazy idea go in and do whatever they think they want. The other thing that I've, I've found is people are coming forward with their ideas, especially if they're testing ideas, um, is that we can actually help them with some feasibility and connect them to other resources. So I, I think while some people have said, you know, I, we shouldn't be doing this, let us just do our research, I think this isn't at a time when we can um, uh, promote pursue business as usual and just let everybody go off and do what they want. I think we're better if we coordinate things resource-wise, and I think we're probably better scientifically. So really look forward to the discussion today so I can learn uh, more about what people are doing and what questions they have regarding uh, COVID research, what some of the opportunities are, how we can make it better and have a bigger impact here um, at CAC and at USC. So it's my yeah, deal. And one other comment, um, we, we started this and it, it's very uh, CAC-centric. 
um, uh, because this was our starting point. I, it, um, I think, you know, we are, we have engaged individuals from the University Park campus and also Children's Hospital Los Angeles on that task force. Um, and I think really we're, we're really wanting to encourage and support those sort of cross cutting cross campus sorts of initiatives. So whereas this might feel now that it's very centric, um, it is not intended to stay that way. Um, a lot of the resources, whether we're talking about patients or for example, that BSL-3, you know, might be located on the Keck campus. And, um, but we certainly want to be partnering with, um, you know, relevant scientists and investigators from, from those two other campuses as well. Is it, Michelle, is oh. it, oh, I'm sorry, please. No, I just was gonna say, I, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Great, uh, thank you so much, Tom and Michelle. All right, well, next we're gonna hear from uh, Jay Jones, or sorry, Jay Jung, who is the Distinguished Professor and Fletcher Jones Foundation Chair for the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. And it's a real honor to have you today, Dr. Jung. So without further ado, I will uh, hand it off to you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you all for that, uh, this, uh, Friday, and uh, uh, what I'm going to tell you is the next 20 minutes uh, briefly about that our biosafety level three and then COVID-19 study. And here is at the first slide is that uh, why that the virus is important. Can I have the next slide? So I think that uh, uh, you know we all know that the globalization and global warming have that two major factor, the prime uh, primary factor causing significant infectious disease that we all recognize. But frankly, even myself as working with that the infectious agent, I really didn't even imagine that uh, this COVID-19 coronavirus causing this much problem. So I think at this time is uh, really we have to seriously consider about that uh, this uh, infectious disease, uh, global infectious disease. Next slide. So what, uh, uh, oops something whole disappear actually here uh why infectious the uh, emerging infectious disease is important is that the uh, non-communicable diseases uh, such as uh, like a uh, cancer or tom buchanan is there so diabetes maybe that uh, the patient maybe that tomorrow will be still the same number <laughs> or zero but infectious disease is a different story today's one patient can be zero or ten 100,000 or 1 million. So ultimately one patient can be enough to induce that uh, potential pandemic. So that's what that the emerging infectious disease is, has a very strong, very powerful issue. But it is important for public health, and, but it is also that it is not just for threat, and we should consider as a disease opportunity to developing scientific activity and education and social science. And that bottom slide is a disappear, but next slide. Oh, okay. So, so uh, go ahead, the next slide. So but this is a region that uh, USC, that King Medical School, that committed to develop that uh, biosafety level three for emerging pathogens. So this biosafety level three was at the operating almost six years at that uh, ZNI, uh, fifth floor, and because of this global warming and the globalization, and I thought that the maybe three area of research will be important. So, uh, number one is that the respiratory uh, tract infection, such as a uh, high pathogenic influenza virus and Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and then third one is uh, now that the SARS coronavirus number two. And then the other area is that the globe, because of global warming and uh, this uh, vector bone uh, uh, infection is a major issue. So mosquito bone infection will be Zika virus and dengue virus and West Nile virus. And then another one is a tick bone virus. Tick bone infection has increased uh, literally almost 600% the last several years. So currently heartland virus 
and uh, severe fever with a thrombocytopenia syndrome virus is uh, starting at that our uh, biosafety level three. I just wanted to point out to you, here is that the influenza virus, mycobacterium tuberculosis, and uh, COVID-19, West Nile, and SFTS virus, those are BSL-3 items, and then Zika virus and Dengue, heartland virus are BSL-2 virus. So nonetheless, this uh, biosafety level 3 is actively running for the last six years. So this actually that uh, this uh, facility provides the opportunity to start in COVID-19 program. Next slide. So I'll just give you that briefly that the, how this SARS coronavirus, especially that the SARS coronavirus one and two uh, virology structure. I just put on it slide because uh, the, this slide is show that the spike protein, virion particle outside has uh, this spike protein. Spike protein, when it enters the cell, they, uh, this spike protein interact with the uh, a uh, cell surface protein called ACE2. And this interaction attachment is of uh, uh, initial that the binding, receptor binding. And then second round is uh, there are another surface protein called TMPRSS2, which is a protease enzyme. And this enzyme now cleave the spike protein to two fragments. When this cleavage occur, now virus can put together with a cell surface membrane starting we call fusogenic, fusion is occur, now virus can enter the uh, host cell. So this that the spike protein interaction with the ACE2 and P TMPRSS2 some major target for vaccine development currently as well as a drug development. So number of people are, are, are interested in how to block the, this spike protein interaction with the ACE2 or TMPRSS2 to block the viral infection. Next slide. And next slide is at, uh, uh, showing that uh, this coronavirus genomic structure. I don't want to go to the whole detail, but this uh, virus is at the single strand positive RNA virus, around 30 kb that the RNA virus, and then including that the number of that uh, uh, protein. Special interest will be there. Are, I put the bottom co protein called polyprotein 1AB. This protein is actually synthesized as a gigantic one large protein. And then this large protein ultimately cleaved by host protease enzyme or viral protease enzyme to make uh, about 16 different viral proteins. So we call non-structural protein one to 16. Among these six protein, there are three proteins are a uh, potential target for drug development because they carry the enzymatic activity. Number one is protease, protease enzyme. Second one is RDRP, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And then third one is a helicase enzyme. So number of that the laboratory and pharmaceutical companies are targeting these three enzymes to block the enzymatic activity to block in viral replications. That's what that the uh, uh, drug target. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, most of that other uh, uh, study, same, same as other study, virus studies, uh, starting with the uh, bulk chemistry, cell biology, structural biology in the laboratory, and moving on to the uh, viral genetic, to generating mutant virus, and whether virus replicating or not, and then third step is then moving into the in vivo animal model, such as a mouse model, feral model, and prime model to study that the uh, host virus interaction, such as uh, immunology and how virus induce that the uh, uh, infection and pathogenesis. Based on all this stage one, two, three data, and ultimately go to the patient to look at the disease 
and immune profiling, whether we can develop the therapy and vaccine. These are uh, virology, but not just for virology, all of cancer, diabetes, many studies are going through the, this stage. However, because of that, the current uh, urgent state, status, next slide, and we are going actually backward. We are starting from patient sample, patient, uh, patient sample going to the animal model and then developing genetic and then ultimately viral function because of it is so urgently we need that the vaccine and understanding virus and they are that the developing that the therapy. So I'm gonna talk about that the uh, uh, COVID study is going backward, starting from patient, animal model and genetic and biochemistry. Next slide. So I, this, uh, uh, this is a summary of that the SARS called that the coronavirus one, which was happened 2003. This is uh, ultimately that the coronavirus is, uh, actually we are getting that the coronavirus infection. Uh, kind of daily and monthly. These are common cold is uh, caused by coronavirus. But so that, uh, but this SARS virus one and two are ultimately immunopathogenesis. So when you look at that, there are two individuals got infection with that, the SARS virus. So first one week is uh, we call hyper innate immune response. And upon viral infection, immediately these two individuals induce that the cytokine, such as an antiviral cytokine, interferon alpha, gamma, and also number of that inflammatory cytokine, including IL-6. And then around day four, that uh, very has a high fever, peak of high the fever, and around day seven, actual virus titer is the highest. So that's around that the one week period of that uh, SARS virus infection. And then day eight and day nine is a very critical time. That's how now course can be changed to non-severe SARS or versus severe SARS. So after day eight, day nine, now adaptive immunity is a kick it in. So when that the patient, that individual has a strong MHC class one mediate T cell response or antibody production, that individual ultimately can handle the virus and then go to that the non-severe SARS phenotype. That individual has a strong antibody response and then ultimately low level of uh, CXCL10, chemokine and interferon. That's a good scenario. However, there is at the uh, bottom patient, it's a crisis. Around after day nine, now this individual could not develop the strong adaptive immunity, low MHC class one mediated immunity, low level of uh, immunoglobulin, that uh, antiviral immunity, and but high level of that CSCL2, CSCL10, uh, and that the uh, interferon response that ultimately lead to that uh, severe hypoxia and severe SARS phenotype. So these are SARS-1, that the uh, course of the patient information and continuously virus disseminating and ultimately after day nine, it will be more that uh, not virus causing that uh, uh, the patient damage, systematic inflammation, ultimately the cytokine storm will damage that the patient organ and tissue that causing that the severe uh, that the uh, uh, SARS phenotype and fatality. So understanding host immune response around day nine and day eight or nine, what makes that the certain patient go to the non-severe SARS phenotype and certain patient go to the severe SARS phenotype. That's what it will be an important question. Next slide. So I'll give you one example. So that's why I know that the number of people 
at the one to look at the patient uh, blood sample to look at the, that patient, the COVID-19 patient immune profiling, what type of cytokine, what kind of that, uh, 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 the chemokine and what kind of soluble factor causing this cytokine storm. So I'll give you that the one example. If I can have a slide. Hello. Looks like somebody stopped sharing. Sorry about that. One minute. Okay. Can I click the one? Sorry, this one? No, no, go forward. Uh, so it, it doesn't work actually. So, so actually the data I gave, put it here is not the COVID-19 patient data. These are, uh, this is an example. This is a Zika pay that uh, positive. So we have a one study is uh, the baby day zero at that birth. So this, we have a 25 Zika positive infant. And then we have a, a day zero healthy infant. We got the only that uh, uh, 10 microliter of plasma. And then using this plasma, we can check the literally 100 inflammatory cytokine. And because of I had a limited budget, that's why we look at the 100. If I have a more budget, I could look at the 300, 500. That's not the issue. So we only look at that uh, 92 cytokine profiling of this healthy infant versus Zika exposed infant day zero. And surprisingly, there is this Zika exposed infant can be divided into the two groups, subgroup subset A or subset B. Subset A and healthy are very close to each other. That I'm talking about this left panel bottom and sub that subset A and healthy, the baby show that very similar inflammatory cytokine panel that the uh, structure. But on the other hand, subset B show that the totally separate that the uh, uh, group. And indeed, if you look at the uh, bottom right, subset B group has a very high level of IL-6 and certain chemokine production. Then we follow that uh, this subset A and subset B infant for two years, what, what kind of that uh, symptom they had it. It turned out that when you look at the top table, subset B baby within two years, literally 70% of this subset B, they developed that the neurological abnormality such as uh, autism and the uh, eye, eye problem and that uh, speaking problem and number of this neurological abnormality and also subset B group in fact actually has about 37, about 40%, the baby has a microcephaly. So what I wanted to point out is uh, even that uh, just looking this baby blood, we could actually look at the inflammatory profiling and that can be a potential biomarker for uh, the future that the disease outcome. I think this is what that the COVID-19 patient blood can be used at a similar approach to look at the, whether this patient developed that the severe SARS versus that the, uh, that the non-severe SARS. That's one example. So next slide. After this patient, then I'm gonna give you that example of our animal model. Currently, there are three animal models are available to, uh, for uh, viral infection and transmission. And most popular one is human ACE2 containing transgenic mice. There are two different transgenic mice available. One is ubiquitously expressing ACE2 in many cell type, or that the uh, long epithelial specific expressing uh, uh, ACE2 transgenic mice available. So when they infect uh, these mice with uh, uh, COVID-19, SARS-2 virus, and by intranasal infection, mouse models show that the uh, high virus titer, but there was not that much symptom. Animal has a 5% weight loss and then immediately recover. And mouse has a no transmission that the uh, uh, system. 
Then second on medium sized animal model is a ferret. We call that the ferret model. We developed this a ferret model for intranasal infection and virus titer. And then ferret indeed show that the high fever, coughing, and more importantly, the ferret show that the transmission. And then third, the large animal model is a primate model. It's so very similar to that the federal result show that the uh, uh, transmission and high fever. So we have a currently two the animal models are available. Next slide. So I'll give you that the federal data. So when we infect the uh, uh, federal by intranasal and uh, all 100% infection and 100% infected Fetal developed a high temperature, lethargic, and uh, uh, that the uh, uh, so that's the intran uh, that the nasal infection was uh, efficient, and then we did a direct infection means uh, we you infect the ferret with the uh, SARS coronavirus two, and day two we then co-house with that the uh, naive ferret, and that this co-housing we call direct infection. It has a hundred percent transmission, and uh, nine ferret immediately got infected and show high temperature and also lethargy. And we also performed that the indirect infection is infected ferret and co house with that the naive ferret, but we actually put that in between that permeable that the sep uh, separation. In, in this condition, we saw that the two out of six ferret get infection, around 30% of trans, uh, uh, transmission. So this, this is a quite similar to that the human setting. So intranasal infection, direct contact is 100% efficiency. Then we look at the virus titer from each organ, and we found that the day four has a high virus titer, especially uh, nasal uh, turbinate has a highest virus titer, followed by lung has a uh, high virus titer. Next slide. So this is what that the immunohistochemistry, we can clearly detect the viral antigen and so at that the infection condition and nasal, trachea, lung, and intestine, we can detect the viral antigen. And when we look at the uh, HNE staining, uh, mark versus infected, uh, infected ferrous show that the uh, uh, bronchial that the area in alveolar wall has a high infiltration of especially neutrophil infiltration and bronchitis. So uh, these ferro models are mimicking human setting. However, that ferros are ultimately recovered around day 10 to day 12 and there was a no fatality. So we are now using that uh, this federal model for further drug development and a vaccine study. Next slide. This is a summary that uh, uh, what we are doing is a current data uh, study. So we are uh, studying that uh, drug develop, uh, drug screening. And this study is uh, so we are working, our lab is working at the BSL-3 for virus culture. And then a uh, USC faculty, there are a number of them actually brought the interesting drug targets, such as, uh, for example, NEO 100 is from Tim Chen and uh, uh, 3 APC from Bessa Zlokovic. So we are testing this uh, drug target in, in uh, and BSL-3 to in vitro inhibition of viral replication. And then we have another collaboration with uh, Dennis and then the collaboration with uh, Steve K and uh, Scripps, the Calibre group, and these drugs are ultimately go to that the federal model to study that the uh, in vivo inhibition. Those are mainly that the uh, uh, drug screening. And my lab own interest is we are screening CRISPR uh, to knock out the, uh, all of that individual host gene to identify the or which host genes are require viral replication. This is what our study. Next slide. So our uh, third one is that the, we have, uh, we are uh, the obtaining uh, that from outside. There are already 
that the viral genetic system so was established in East model and E. coli model. So by using East and E. coli, we could actually generate the mutant viral that the fragment, and then from the virus, we could I generate the RNA, transfer into the cell, then we could isolate the wild type virus or GFP virus. Well, ultimately our goal is that generating attenuate that the SARS virus for potential vaccine candidate. Final one is that the, we are using ferritin. This is a, a protein forming a large protein structure, 20 former nanoparticle structure. So we actually put that the spike protein, this receptor binding domain to making a, a, a spike ferritin fusion protein. And that the uh, nanoparticles are already injected to uh, ferrot to look at the uh, uh, vaccine. That's what we are working. But I wanted to point out is that the SARS virus, ultimately that the most of pathogenesis and fatalities are uh, uh, associated with that the aged population. So another experiment we are currently working on is infecting young ferrot, age two years old ferrot versus a, or the aged ferret over four years old, which is equivalent to 70 years old human. So we are infecting young and aged ferret to look at the pathogenesis. Those are what we are working on it. Next slide. I just give you that uh, we have a number of people ask us about this pseudotype virus because uh, uh, not everyone can work uh, inside of the BSL-3. So this pseudotype virus means uh, such as a vascular stomatitis virus, VSP, or lentivirus, HIV viral particle, it carrying that the SARS, SARS spike protein. So we have a pseudotype VSP spike, pro uh, spike protein virus that carrying that the luciferase. And the uh, uh, second one is a pseudotype lentivirus spike uh, virus carrying GFP. So these two, that pseudotype virus can be used for that uh, viral entry study or drug study or number of other study for at the BSL-2 lab in regular laboratory setting. So those are two uh, systems are available. We already distribute that around four or five laboratory at USC. And then if anybody wants to know or the use of this system, just send me an email, then we can provide. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna follow on from where Jay left off. Um, Jay's given a great, uh, great introduction to SARS and the virus and the animal models. Um, what I'm going to tell you about here is some of the uh, in vitro human airway epithelial cell models that we have available to work with. Um, we're currently collaborating with several people already on utilizing these um, models. Um, so I'm going to discuss the models and, um, and let you know what's available in the lab uh, for studying uh, viral infection in human cells. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm an assistant professor in a school of medicine and also stem cell regenerative medicine. And my lab really focuses on uh, modeling and studying mechanisms of lung development and disease with a focus on tissue regeneration and stem cell mediated repair in the airways. Um, we specialize in the development and use of pluripotent stem cell models of lung disease. Um, so for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, um, resources, we have a variety of different cellular models that we use in the lung. And these include um, primary human airway epithelial cells. These we isolate from explant lungs from the tracheobronchial and distal regions. We have primary uh, ferret airway epithelial cells that have been isolated from the tracheobronchial regions. We also have pluripotent stem cell derived human airway epithelial cells, which are equivalent to those isolated from the tracheobronchial regions and iPSC derived alveolar type two epithelial cells, which we can grow and expand in 3D and 2D models. So on the right hand side of this slide, um, you've got an image here that shows the entire human airway tree. As you can see, it's a rather complex structure that has multiple branches where you go from the largest airways, which are the trachea, through the conducting airways of the bronchi down to the smaller bronchioles and eventually you um, reach the gas exchange in alveolar regions. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about these cells and give you some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of using each of these as models for your research. Uh, I think one of the most important things to realize about the human lung is that the cell type and distribution changes as you move from the proximal to distal region in the, in the lung. So when you're talking about lung infection involving a virus, you're talking about the involvement of a number of different cell types along different regions of the airways. The final technology I'm going to talk to you about is the lung chip technology. And this is actually going to be my lab's primary focus for our research projects on SARS-CoV-2. And we hope that eventually this will be available for assisting with target validation for uh, other research around USC. Uh, if we can move slides to the next slide, please. Okay, so Jay gave a, a very nice introduction to animal models. And uh, the one thing you may have noticed was that the mice um, do not always recapitulate um, human physiology and pathophysiology very well. Although we have a number of transgenic models, they can be very useful. But um, for the airways in particular, they're not always a good model of airway disease and response to disease. And quite often they'll only capture some of the clinical features that occur in humans, but rarely all of these. Um, mice also lack airways that resemble the cellular distribution that's found in the human trachea and bronchi. So in the human trachea and bronchi, you actually have submucosal glands which secrete mucus into the airways. In the mice, these regions don't exist, so you're not getting a lot of the mucus secretions that you would have in the human airways. Um, they also have a different distribution of their secretory cells throughout the airways to what humans do. So again, you're not necessarily going to be fully recapitulating um, the same airway responses in a mouse as you would in humans. And unfortunately, this has uh, led to many cl clinical trials that have resulted for um, therapeutics that have failed in, um, in clinical trials uh, due to this. Uh, lung diseases actually had the lowest success rate of therapeutics navigating successfully through clinical trials. So on the right hand side of this slide, I include the different platforms that we have of airway cells. Starting at the top of the pyramid with the easiest, so um, I'm moving down to the most challenging models. So the easiest models we have are cell lines. Um, these are immortalized cells. These are obviously easy to um, use in the lab, they're scalable, they're easy to proliferate. They can be readily infected and used for target validation, but these cells are going to lack a lot of the relevant cellular biology that you would have in a primary airway cell. The next level are our primary airway cells. Um, these need some level of experience to be able to expand these while maintaining the properties of being a stem cell in the airways, which means that these cells are able to give rise to the differentiated cells within the airways. So a lung basal cell is able to give rise to the functional cells, which are the ciliated, the secretary, um, and the secretary cells in the airways. So these cells we can grow, we can expand, but they have a limited number of passages in culture. So you have a, a limited scaling um, possible with these cells. However, they're endogenous cells, so now you're going to capture more of the relevant cellular biology and responses in these cells. The third model are, are IPSC, or induced pluripotent stem cell models. Um, these are a little more difficult, they're more time consuming because now we have to go from an embryonic stem cell like state through to a lung progenitor which will then differentiate into the mature cells of the lung. So the timing here, it's, it's very time consuming, it takes a couple of months to go from A to Z. Um, however, IPSC have infinite expansion capacity. You can readily gene edit these, you can clonally select them and isolate them so you can actually make nice isogenic comparisons where you're mutating one thing. Um, so it makes them a very nice model when you want them to specifically look at certain genes, certain proteins. Then moving there, the most complex system that we have right now is our lung chip model. These are more complex and especially for the lung version of this chip, um, we need speciality expertise. And I'm very lucky that we've just hired um, Jana Nawath, who worked at Emulate um, Inc., who developed the lung chip. So she actually has uh, optimized this for looking at airway with an endothelium and, um, and circulating immune cells as well. And I'll come on and show you a little bit more about this in the next few slides. This model now really has the, the capacity for recapitulating a tissue microenvironment in a dish. Um, so you're going to capture a lot more of the relevant cellular biology and tissue level responses within this system. So I think this is a great kind of uh, transition to a preclinical or in vivo model um, with some relevant human biology. If we can move on to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is just walking you through a few of these models that I've discussed. The first is used in primary um, human or ferret airway epithelial cells. So these we get from explant lung tissue. This uh, photograph here is not of a healthy lung. Um, this is actually of a patient with cystic fibrosis. So we can see a lot of scarring in the lung. But we're able to go in, isolate the airways, and purify out airway basal cells, which you can see in the face contrast image next to this. These we can expand for between five and 10 passages in culture. So we have the capacity for expansion, but not a huge amount. Um, and during this time, they will maintain the differentiation potential. And by that, I mean we can expand them and then we can put them onto an air liquid interface culture. So this is a trans well which hangs within a cell culture dish. We plate the basal cells in there, let them get to confluence and generate uh, a resistance. So you will form tight junctions across the monolower cells. We can then remove the media in the apical surface of this and expose it to air. And over a 28 day period, these cells will fully differentiate into all the cells that comprise of the airways. If you look on the, this middle diagram on the right hand side, this is a cartoon um, recapitulating what we have in those dishes now. So you will have a, a pseudo stratified airway epithelium where you'll have the basal cells closer to the basal lateral membrane. You will then have ciliated cells, which are responsible for protection of the airways and mucociliary clearance, so moving out the uh, mucus from the airways. You will then have secretory cells in the form of goblet cells and club cells, which secrete mucus and surfactant proteins. Um, so this is a fully functioning um, airway in a dish. You can see mucus swirling in the dish as the cilia coordinate and beat around the dish. Um, so this is a really useful model um, that is a physiological system, but again, it is only the airway here. You've not got any underlying endothelium or immune cells in the system. We can add both of those layers to this system, but only one at a time, um, and it gets more complex for analysis. So the advantages of these mod uh, models is that these are human primary cells that are going to be much closer to an endogenous cellular phenotype than using a cell line. We can infect them with lentivirus, so you can do knockdown and overexpression fairly easily in those. And we can gene edit them with CRISPR facilitating gene knockout studies. Um, the disadvantages is that you're going to have heterogeneity in response. This may be considered an advantage depending on your study, but each of these cells are, are isolated from individual subjects. Um, those subjects have all passed away from, for one reason or another, so they've all had different environmental exposures and, and different, potentially different diseases. So we have a variety of cells in our lab from different diseases or healthy donors um, who passed away, unfortunately. Also due to this, you're gonna get phenotypic heterogeneity. Uh, you'll have variability due to age and disease, but this may be lost by clonal selection and culture. Once you take these cells out of the airways and grow them, you may lose some of this heterogeneity. And over time in passages with any cell that you maintain in a dish, you're going to lose, um, uh, have a slight change in phenotype as you passage the, passage the cells. And once you get these past about eight to 10 passages, they lose that capacity to go from a basal cell into that pseudostratified airway epithelium. We can also grow these cells as spheroids. Um, uh, as you can see on the bottom images on the right hand side, the uh, image on the left is an undifferentiated spheroid that you can see basal cells forming. The cartoon on the right hand side is a differentiated spheroid. The disadvantage of these is that the airway faces inside, so you don't have access to the apical surface, you have access to the basal lateral surface. Um, we can generate these the other way around with the cilia on the outside, um, however it is a little more challenging and not so robust. If we can move on to the next slide please. So this is a very brief summary of the IPSC derived cells. As I said here, we have the equivalent of what I've just described, the primary airway epithelial cells. And we're also able to, uh, to derive IPSC uh, human alveolar type two epithelial cells. This is a sna snapshot of the protocol prior to generating an NKX 2.1 expressing lung progenitor. This is the transcription factor that is first turned on as the lung specifies. Um, we have nearly 20 days of differentiation to get to that point. But at this point, we can select these out and then through a combination of culture conditions where we change the cytokines and growth factors, we're able to push them either to specify basal stem cells, which will give rise to tracheobronchial airways, or to specify alveolar type two cells, which will then give rise to alveolar type one cells. And you can see the image on the uh, right-hand side at the top there is just an example of a fully differentiated 
IPS derived airway epithelium where you can see tight junctions uh, marked in red and you can see cilia projections which are marked in the cyan color. And this is very similar to what you would get from any primary cell line. So the major advantages of the IPSC here is that we have an unlimited supply of them. Um, they're readily gene edited. They're readily uh, virally infected as well. Um, you can make isogenic cell lines for comparative study of, of select proteins or genes. You can clone and select these and purify them. Um, it over, so therefore it overcomes the pathogen issues of basal cells and the alveolar type two cells do not maintain well in culture and when isolated from the lung, they undergo a very rapid differentiation to alveolar type one cells. We're able to actually maintain the human IPSC derived alveolar type two cells as type two cells. So that is a slight advantage there. The biggest disadvantages right now is that um, the basal cells are 3D model, the air, air liquid interfaces are still being reliably validated by the labs that have developed these, including my lab. And the alveolar type two, cell, two cells, the, the exact similarity to the primary cells is not 100% known yet. Um, sequence and studies are still going on. And the fact that we can expand these when, where you can't expand primary cells um, suggests that there are some differences. But again, it's a nice tool to be able to use. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Okay, this is just a little bit of data looking at the TMPRSS2 and ACE2 expression. I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, Jay has already given a nice introduction to the uh, rationale behind looking at ACE2 and TMPRSS. We know that they're both highly expressed in alveolar type 2 cells and uh, to some extent in type 1 cells and also in endothelial cells. ACE2 is, um, provides a nice protective mechanism in the alveolar, in the epithelium, uh, endothelium, sorry. But in our airways, we've looked through our single cell data and we can see that ACE2 expression, although seemingly low, is highly correlated with the ciliated cells and the goblet cells. Uh, and TMPRSS seems to be uh, much higher uh, at a much higher expression level in the same cell types. We can also see that in our iPSC-derived lung basal cells, so these are the ones before we actually differentiate, that there is the highest expression of, um, of ACE2. If you, this is the bottom left panels we're looking at right now. The highest expression of ACE2 there correlates to a basal cell that's actually undergoing a secretory cell type transition. So it's a, it's a basal cell already starting to differentiate, and those are the cells that are most highly expressing ACE2 um, in those cultures. So it seems to be associated with a ciliated and a secretory cell phenotype and present in a subpopulation of the basal cells. The image there that you can see was actually taken from some fetal lung cells where you can see that ACE2 expression, we've only seen it correlating with the acetylated tubulin um, stained ciliated cells. Um, so it seems like in, the, in that culture, um, we're still seeing a high level of the protein in ciliated cells. So if we can move on to the next slide. So this is the final model that we have. Um, we are going to be focusing our efforts in the lab in collaboration with Jay Jung on um, looking at viral infection in this system. This system is really nice because you have, um, if you're looking at the diagram on the left hand side, you have an airflow channel on the top which then leads down to the airway epithelium. Underneath the airway epithelium, you have your membrane that you're growing your cells on. On the bottom side of that, you can grow endothelial cells. And then on the very bottom channel, you can perfuse um, blood, lymphocytes, neutrophils. Um, so you can actually recapitulate a, a, a mini little tissue here. Also, if you, if you were to use this with alveolar cells, there, is, um, there are vacuum channels, so you can actually have some level of threatening with them. So mimicking some of the physio uh, physiological properties in the lung. So this is really nice because we can use this to have a, a really good physiological airway tissue architecture and we can look at the defense functions. We can have real time sampling and manipulation of clinically relevant responses in this model, such as looking at cytokine release, mucus production, mucosal clearance, relevant gene protein expressions, and also the recruitment of circulating immune cells and the effect on the endothelium too. And the data on the right hand side is just some data from my, um, my senior scientist, Jana Nawath. Um, this paper's on bioarchives right now, but it shows that we're able to do repeated sampling over a time course and look at changes in um, cytokine responses over that period of time. Um, here we're showing it for uh, interferon, IL-6, and, um, and CXCL-10. 
there is a movie in the middle of it. It doesn't seem to be showing, um, but the movie in the middle actually shows that we can in real time monitor neutrophils attached into the endothelium in these models. And so we can look at neutrophil recruitment and migration through the tissue. Um, and, and the graph on the right hand side is just, uh, it's just monitoring that in the presence or absence of HRV16 infection. So this provides, I think, the closest physiological model you could get to human, an in vivo human system um, in a dish, uh, which I think is a nice transition for validating hits that people have got from their drug targets. Um, I think it would be a really nice system for that. Um, obviously, it's a very complex system to set up. You're managing several cell types and a lot of complexity to the model, but um, um, moving into, before we're moving into in vivo or moving into humans, I think it may be a very nice model um, that people may want to consider collaborating with us on. And then I think that's my last slide. Do I have another? That is the last one. That is the last slide, yes. Yeah. So um, I'm making all these models um, ourselves available to anyone who would like to consider collaborating. Um, just get in touch with me. We obviously have a capacity for how many people we can work with, but if anyone is interested, just let me know. Um, the lung chip models are not going to be available immediately, but again, if you have interest in using them, um, contact me and let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I want to open it up to questions at this time, uh, starting with one that came in uh, through the chat, I think directed to Dr. J which is, do capsid proteins of COVID-19 have NLS? And can COVID-19 or other coronaviruses, N or S proteins alone, cause cellular dysfunctions? I don't think that the coronavirus replicate in the cytosol. And so I don't think that the, uh, uh, that the capsid protein has a, a nuclear localization signal. But that one is that the, I haven't test, I haven't checked it, but maybe not and then uh, m protein and s protein causing any cellular dysfunction yes there are a number this is probably um, uh, 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 most of the topics that a uh, number of people are interested in so i know that uh, uh, there are a number of laboratories are uh, carrying uh, individual viral gene expression library there are so far about 17 to 20 different viral proteins are expressed upon viral replication. So individually clone this gene for uh, expression and they actually use uh, this system for testing that uh, uh, cellular function. So those are probably available. My labs are, we have it, but uh, we received it, uh, those library, but expression has a problem. So we are make, uh, remaking a whole expression library. Great. Uh, are there any other questions? Mary, I see one more um, from John Nickel down there on the chat. Yeah, my, my question is that there's been a lot of discussion about possibly a, an escape of virus from the Wuhan lab in China. I don't think there's been any real clear evidence that that happened. Um, but I'm just curious, what, what do you do in your BSL-3 labs to prevent any of this sort of thing from happening? So BSL, I think that I saw that the Jill Henry is at the G BSL three managers site so here and in the audience. I saw her uh, that, uh, and but the, I think she can answer more detail. But BSL three facility has a negative pressure and that carried the multi door, so uh, that the, that entrance can require a minimum three or four different door to pass to the lab to working on that the viruses. So that uh, uh, get, uh, getting this virus out from BSL-3 facility is uh, literally in, impossible. And Jill, are you available to talk more? Maybe she left. No, I'm so, here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to say more? Uh, sure. So just in regards to the general safety and bringing samples out. Um, so for those of you who aren't aware of the uh, facility functions of a BSL-3, it is, um, as Jay said, a negative uh, pressure. And the idea is that it has a dedicated exhaust system. So all work is done within primary containment as you would in any other lab. 
but it has the facility functions of a dedicated exhaust, um, the negative differential airflow that's monitored and alarmed at all times. So um, those are just some of the initial safety precautions. Obviously, we have administrative precautions, SOP precautions um, that, that aid in trying to get a whole virus out to uh, difficult. That address the question. <laughs> And then actually that the, uh, we, there is also autoclaves. So everything go in will be uh, that the autoclave then come out except human. Right. <laughs> that's good. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's another part of the question too, is if, if one of the workers, uh, any of the researchers get infected somehow accidentally uh, and they're asymptomatic, uh, how do you, how would you manage that? And maybe that's too large of a question and, Actually, it's, it's probably one of the simpler questions. Um, so we've actually talked about this um, both with the researchers and our biosafety team. Actually, going into the BSL-3 is probably the safest place you can be if you are with someone who is asymptomatic. Um, the personal protective equipment that's required is um, a dedicated respiratory unit. Um, so all airflow that goes um, out from their unit is all HEPA filtered. Um, so the, the air circulating within the facility is HEPA filtered air um, through their the respiratory unit. Um, and as far as close contact, um, upon entrance, everybody is wearing, you know, the limited medical masks for any um, possible um, short distance exposures. But the moment they put the respiratory protection on, we have disposable scrubs, Tyvek coveralls, as well as the respiratory protection. Um, and our administrative procedures require them to wash their hands prior to leaving the facility. And um, we do have a shower within the facility as well, should the researchers decide that they want to shower out as well. And also, uh, my lab, I have uh, that uh, temperature gone, so I can check that uh, uh, the BSL-3 workers at their temperature anytime. Great, thanks. I have a question, Jay. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, uh, about the ferret model. So after recovery from virus, I think in ten, day 10, right? 10th day. Mm -hmm. after, then uh, how about the lung inflammation and damage? Is that, will that last much longer or also recovery? Uh, we actually, we didn't uh, wait that long. Actually, after day 10, what they, uh, we did it with that the uh, lung pathology was uh, day eight or day 10. Within that, that uh, after 10 days or 20 days, we didn't, we didn't look at that, that the uh, federal lung because uh, they recover, but I don't know whether their lungs also recover or not. That one we have not done, we haven't checked yet. So when you say recover,